good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining. And um, uh, and uh, thank you for your interest in this series of lecture that is part of an international workshop uh, that focuses on uh, the exchange between the Balkans and the Middle East during the late Ottoman Empire and the way how uh, uh, the the migration of people also translated into the uh, 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 moving of material worlds, uh, which is which entails architecture, but uh, far beyond also uh, all the material practices and products. Uh, so for tonight, we, uh, this is the second lecture that um, is part of our series, and uh, we are very happy to have tonight Dr. Isa, Isa Blumi. Sorry. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Isa Blumi is uh, from the Turkish and Middle Eastern Studies at the Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at Stockholm University. And um, uh, he's a, an associate professor at uh, uh, of the Turkish and Middle Eastern studies uh, within, uh, as I said, the Department uh, of Asian and Middle Eastern studies. And he holds a PhD in history and Middle Eastern and Islamic studies from New York University. Uh, which he gained in 2005, and a uh, Master of Political Sciences and Historical Studies, uh, which he achieved in 1995 from uh, the New School for so Social Research uh, in New York as well. Uh, Aisa Blumi researches society and the throes of social economic and uh, political transformation. In the past, he compared um, how Austro-Hungarian, Russian, Italian, British, Dutch, Spanish, and French imperialist projects in the Islamic world intersected uh, with and uh, were thus informed by uh, events within the Ottoman Empire. Uh, his latest work covers uh, the late Ottoman period and uh, successor regimes arguing that events in the Balkans and the Middle East uh, are the engines of change uh, in the larger world. In this respect, he explores uh, in a comparative integrated manner uh, how post-Ottoman societies uh, found in, for instance, uh, Albania, Yugoslavia, Turkey, uh, and uh, the Gulf and Yemen fit uh, into what is a global history of transition. Uh, this is in turn, uh, this in turn informs uh, the story of the Atlantic world, especially the emergence of modern European imperialism in the Americas. So definitely uh, uh, a perspective that uh, is, uh, that is uh, rather, uh, in new and not the, I would say, the mainstream that we find in the academic debate. So once again, Dr. Blumi, thank you so much for being with us tonight uh, and uh, for uh, dedicating your time to us with your lecture. And uh, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for this kind of, uh, invitation to uh, share some insights and reflections on I think it's desperately needed uh, continuation of a, a phase of, of uh, research that is interdisciplinary uh, and explicitly tries to reconnect the links that the Balkans have long had with the East Mediterranean world. I would argue even further afield to even parts of tropical East Africa and the Indian Ocean, but maybe that's too much to discuss for today. Uh, for some reason, uh, the associations between the Balkans that we were studying in the 1980s and the 1990s uh, with the Middle East have stopped. And I'm hoping that your initiative has maybe reignited an interest. Uh, so I'm very grateful for the opportunity to meet with uh, members of the workshop. And it's a great uh, privilege and honor to uh, follow up on Don, Dr. Don Chatty's uh, already introductory uh, survey of the events and some of the legal and structural uh, uh, processes that shaped uh, the, the relationship between the Ottoman Empire and the uh, arrival of large numbers of migrants from the larger Black Sea uh, region, uh, Central Asia, 
and how they were in, in many ways instrumentalized to serve uh, a state building process in the latter part of the Ottoman Empire in uh, Mashrik or the Bilad Sham. So I continue on with that, with the assumption that either you have watched or you will watch um, and look at more detail uh, some of the slides that Dr. Chadi provided and presume to uh, some uh, factors that I think will be uh, crucial for us moving forward to talk about kind of material, uh, intellectual, uh, spiritual uh, fusions of uh, regions that were once integrated by a unified empire, whether it be the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, and then later its successor, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, again, linking territories that un in the 20th century has unfortunately been dissociated from each other. So uh, a, map, a, a map of the Khedivat of Egypt uh, under uh, the dynasty established by Muhammad Ali Pasha, uh, who himself is an Albanian speaker from Kavala, which is in present day Northern Greece, uh, took the shape on the maps by the beginning of the 1830s in ways that are very instructive to what I wish to propose for the larger uh, presentation on Migra migration flows, uh, the material uh, and uh, intellectual uh, uh, corresponding uh, uh, links, uh, foundations that are, are established with uh, such an enterprise that is primarily a modern state building project. In many ways, indeed, Muhammad Ali's Egypt, from the moment that he successfully secures power in Cairo in 1805, to really the end of 1830s in which uh, his enterprise uh, had incorporated large parts of uh, Syria, larger Syria, including Palestine, uh, had secured the Hejaz, as well as you can see on this map, extending deep into tropical East Africa. Uh, a zone of cultural um, integration um, by way of a state building project that required uh, the skill set of a certain types of, uh, let's say, agents of this modernization process, this modern state that is associated with the Hadivet of Egypt. So one of our important uh, uh, linkages that I will associate with uh, this process of modern state building, uh, uh, synonymous with uh, the Muhammad Ali's Egypt and that of his sons and then grandsons who would then uh, lead and uh, create, help create the modern Egyptian state uh, of the 20th century, um, is uh, to appreciate how and who actually comes and who is attracted to uh, this growing superpower in the region, uh, nominally part of the Ottoman territories, but growing independently for, of now a very uh, conflicted political uh, situation in the rest of the Ottoman Empire. In many ways, something that Muhammad Ali Pasha is going to, sorry, a cat is um, interfering with my uh, discussions. Sweetie Pie, you have to leave, sorry. Okay, where was I? So um, cultural exchange, unknown aspects of cultural exchange, ex shared and in developed and enhanced styles uh, will become the byproduct of these migrations from primarily the zones in which Muhammad Ali comes originally himself, um, uh, to a large extent, the main uh, uh, governors of his various territories as he expands into Sudan, into what today is Uganda, uh, parts of Rwanda, and Ethiopia, and even uh, the coastal parts of Yemen, will be men who spoke a common language and who were recruited accordingly. Uh, the, the very interesting story of how uh, expertise, how uh, certain associations through home territories uh, will lead to a chain of migration that accompanies the expanding uh, capacities of a state that is investing heavily, not only in administering vast territories as you again can see in this map, but also instilling this structure of the state, which includes uh, in the case of uh, uh, this expansion into the areas of Ethiopia and Sudan, the introduction of certain kinds of mason work, uh, the, the the, the, the building of defensive walls and barracks um, and even roads and bridges will be something that is inherited from the men who come to serve Muhammad Ali's uh, state. And again, most of them are coming from the Balkans, 
appear in these famous pictures, late Orientalist uh, the, uh, pictures, the drawings uh, of Egypt by French uh, and Italian masters depicting these Albanian soldiers in various settings of Muhammad Ali's now expanding empire. They're not just soldiers, but they're also bringing an aesthetic, but also certain kinds of uh, methods of construction, especially their expertise in uh, building defensive walls and infrastructure to take care of these fortresses throughout the Muhammad Ali uh, enterprise uh, will leave a, um, an enduring impact on uh, especially regions like Sudan and Ethiopia. Uh, and anyone who has traveled in these regions will note the continuation of some of these system, systems of defense that I suggest were introduced thanks to uh, the recruitment of troops from Muhammad Ali's um, homeland in the Balkans. We've already seen this phenomenon happen throughout the history of the Ottoman Empire with uh, certain groups of people who are uh, associated with certain types of skills, whether it be woodwork or uh, uh, stone masonry, um, who have uh, the capacity to um, help uh, build an expanding uh, early modern Ottoman state, um, often results in large migrations of peoples from these, uh, let's say, uh, regions that are exporting certain uh, skill sets, certain uh, 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 groups of, of uh, talented art artisans, they will end up uh, establishing neighborhoods in some of the main areas of uh, state investment in infrastructure building. Or um, in the case of uh, Istanbul, uh, the building of some of these magnificent uh, uh, structures of, of State power that will be associated with uh, the early modern period, especially during the Suleimani period. And famously, uh, one of those towns which would house the first generation of these artisans coming from uh, the Albanian territories would be and still is identified um, by the name of those who settled there, Arnavutkoy. Uh, so this is a process that goes back uh, a long time and has an interesting uh, multi generational impact. Uh, the case of Sinan Pasha. Is, uh, it's debated from where he's actually his parent, his father comes, but he inherits a certain uh, skill set from his father, who was indeed recruited, and then uh, uh, was settled in an area close to what it is today known as Kaisere, uh in Western Anatolia, um, and uh, uh, deriving from the settlement of his father, who had a subsequently Sinan Pasha as his child. He learned a certain skill set and very actively involved in um, doing similar things in terms of recruiting um, identifiable uh, talent from primarily the Balkans, as we will see from his structures, if anyone has spent time looking at this rather impressive uh, uh, network of artisans uh, um, and uh, the supply chain of material to build these magnificent structures associated with Sinan Pasha and his various in that era. Uh, so uh, some of the things that became synonymous uh, with, uh, with the Balkans and then thus resulted in migration, even if it's just temporary migration of skilled workers to uh, build infrastructure throughout the Ottoman Empire, included bridge building. Uh, some of the uh, remnants of the skill that uh, are famous, maybe perhaps most famous in Mostar, uh, but you can find them scattered throughout uh, the terrain that had required uh, linking uh, uh, trade routes up that would, um, as you can see, uh, overtake the uh, seasonal uh, uh, rivers and creeks that uh, um, makes this part of the uh, Ottoman Balkans very difficult to travel through. Uh, Nevertheless, the necessary skills that are sometimes uniquely associated with groups of people from the Balkans ends up being exported temporarily to other parts of the empire. And this is why you see a replication of tech building technique with even the material itself sometimes imported from the districts from which these skilled uh, architects and engineers come. And uh, some, some uh, quite classical Albanian Western, southern Albanian style. This is a city of Barat today. Uh, 
uh, to the left and to the right is these famous uh, large houses of merchants from Geocaster and Barat in what today is Southern Armenia. Uh, I suggest becomes some, a working model for not only those who are artisans who come from these regions and then apply them wherever they are, uh, let's say, recruited to bring their skills in other parts of the Mediterranean world. Uh, but as many of these prominent actors come from uh, the, the Balkans and then establish themselves as governors, as military leaders, um, who come and settled in other parts, especially in the uh, Mashrik region during the course of the 19th and early 20th century, uh, they will sometimes even bring um, references to their homeland uh, and actually uh, commission the construction of homes that will re replicate what they had back home. As again, as Don Chatty yesterday suggested, or two days ago suggested, uh, with the case of Circassians migrating to uh, the region. Um, some more pictures that give you a sense of the uh, what is understood to be unique styles, from the woodworking in the interiors to the pattering of uh, the paintings on the on the sides. This uh, mafraj so, so, space of, uh, uh, of sometimes uh, it, I understood as quite uh, uh, private, but also public uh, um, spaces in which one could see it from the streets uh, uh, the interactions of people. Uh, uh, very distinctive from uh, another region of uh, uh, where Albanians and their neighbors inhabit, uh, which would be associated with these kule or these these uh, fortress homes, where in which extended families would live in multiple storied homes, which would be easily defended from uh, rival families or indeed invading armies. And this becomes also a style synonymous with this region, which requires considerable skill and may have been part of some of the expertise and aesthetic that was uh, brought by soldiers from these regions, uh, artisans from these regions when they find themselves either involuntarily expelled from their homelands and end up as refugees in other parts of the Ottoman Empire or in the post-Ottoman world or as uh, temporary mercenaries uh, elsewhere. You see similar uh, architecture in parts of southern Italy, where many Albanians uh, or peoples of this part of the Balkans migrated in the 15th and 16th century. So the continuity and the uh, expansion of certain styles that seem to be uh, something that may be worthy of exploring further. Uh, other crucial elements that, that links the, the Balkans uh, with uh, especially uh, Bilal Sham uh, in the uh, modern era are the actual governors uh, in this transitional phase or period, uh, what would be identified as the Tanzimat era in the Ottoman context, uh, certain concessions given uh, to the great powers as the Ottoman becomes increasingly dependent on global, uh, especially European and North American finance, uh, leads to these concessions given in the 1860s, uh, known as the Mutar Sharifa era, in which Catholic or Ottoman Catholics would be uh, 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 required to govern areas that were deemed under French uh, protection, um, uh, uh, needed to be protected from uh, the mishaps or the mis uh, misgovernance of Muslims or non uh, Catholics. Uh, so. so, one of the only areas in which the Ottoman Empire could provide those kinds of governors that satisfy these demands were in fact from these same areas that I showed you pictures of, uh, especially in the areas around the port city of Shkoder, which is currently on the northern, northern part of Albania that borders uh, Montenegro. And this, in, this individual, Vasa Pasha, who was a, earlier a governor of, of uh, Sarajevo, uh, is made his fortune um, uh, through his connections, his trans-Adriatic connections with Italy, it is, it was indeed Italy, and brings with him when he's uh, elected to be governor of Mount uh, Lebanon, uh, he brings a certain esprit of governance that reflects the emerging republicanism of the Italian, unified Italian state, uh, uh, and accordingly brings uh, through his networks recruits a number of, of, of 
people from his immediate homeland region, but also uh, the larger Adriatic world. And that has, I would suggest, an interesting contributions to how uh, Mount Lebanon, uh, the commercial and uh, transport uh, networks are going to be drawn out, uh, how money is going to be spent to develop the port of Beirut. And these are also, I think, areas of further exploration if someone is interested. Uh, this, this is a period uh, that, that corresponds also with the dramatic transformations of the Western Syrian economy, the uh, arrival of uh, private uh, investors who are now allowed, thanks to the 1858 uh, concessions given by a nearly bankrupted Ottoman state, for foreigners to go and buy properties, had dramatic consequences, as we know, with the case of Palestine, but also Western Syria, in which large numbers of Syrian peasants were uprooted from their lands. Much of the uh, land became converted to produce industrial uh, crops, whether they be cotton uh, and fleeting or other, other things like oranges, or citrus, leading to uh, an initial phase of migration to uh, urban areas in which factories were built and is readily available cheap labor uh, was exploited. And then ultimately uh, migration of especially men uh, to these growing uh, opportunities to find work in um, the, the Americas, whether it be serving as colonizers of North Africa, or sorry, North America, uh, or it, um, in these still uh, underpopulated regions of Brazil, Argentina, Chile, et cetera. And so this is a, a period of synonymous with the rise of this Safaria, which sees a new wave of uh, Balkan migrants, mostly following uh, the, co uh, the coat tales of um, fellow uh, Albanians, fellow Greeks, who are um, now expected to help service um, a integration of this region into the globally modern economy. Um, uh, so I will move quickly away, but just to note that also other important artisan uh, skill sets that are synonymous with uh, this part of the Western Balkans includes metalworks and uh, guns and armament industry, uh, which uh, was, uh, these, were, these are works of art, would ultimately become transformed uh, and mass produced um, by German uh, and Belgium companies. But until this 1870s period, in which I just I spoke, uh, the artisans who are going to build weapons, whether it be for Muhammad Ali's state or uh, indeed in some parts of the Ottoman Syria, uh, were also imported from the Balkan, moved from a certain aesthetic and style that may or may not also reflect in um, some areas where they settled in uh, the uh, Ilad Sham. Another very interesting figure who I, I know uh, quite a bit from the context of him being a nationalist poet in Albanian language, uh, Filip Shiroka, uh, himself, again, a Catholic who uh, moved uh, to Beirut uh, at the behest of his um, uh, countryman, fellow countryman, this governor of Mount Lebanon, uh, Basa Basha, I showed you a picture of before. He, and he would ultimately spend the rest of his life in Beirut, but he would be in, intermingling uh, with uh, this large numbers of Albanians who are now moving uh, to, uh, in the post 1880s uh, throughout the East Mediterranean to look for work. Uh, they have, uh, they, they represent a new group of educated, many of them educated in uh, Ottoman state uh, funded uh, universities or technical schools. In the case of Shiroka, he himself uh, got educated in Italy. He learned to become an engineer and it, he would then eventually establish himself uh, first in Egypt and then to Lebanon where he would be an engineer working on the many railroads that were being built at the time. Many of the railroads which were commissioned by governors, either in Egypt or in Lebanon, who themselves were from the Western Balkans and were particularly keen on recruiting and uh, bringing uh, fellow countrymen with this certain skill set. What for me is quite interesting, Chiroka will ultimately become a subject of the French during the Mandate era, and he um, established an architecture film, a firm in Beirut up until at least the 1930s. It's very hard for him to track his family any longer uh, there. So if anyone knows anything about the interwar uh, Beirut uh, architecture firms, I would love to hear from you. Uh, 
with an email. Um, uh, but what I suspect, as I understand it, that while he was a nationalist poet, uh, uh, thinking of his homeland through his poetry, he was also someone heavily invested in a certain kind of modern style that he learned about when in Italy. And there may be some interesting uh, corresponding uh, results uh, of not only his firm, but many others who would come and have been trained in uh, these different uh, schools of architecture and, um, uh, in the Mediterranean world and who are now settling in these boom economies of Egypt and the Mashiv in the 1890s, 1900s. Uh, and this is something that I try to challenge in some of my research where I actually bring up some of these individuals and, and in certain chapters of this book, Reinstating the Ottomans, highlighting the fact that we run into big trouble when we think about the men that I've just mentioned as strictly uh, uh, men of their homelands. Uh, they in fact become part of a much larger imperial enterprise where territorially speaking, their homes are very much as much Egypt or Lebanon as uh, Western Balkans. And this is, a, this is an effort that I have made throughout the, my, my career to somehow complicate the relationship uh, um, between uh, the Balkans and the Middle East at least, um, uh, while not succumbing to these anachronisms of ethno-nationalism that often come many years after the, the demise of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, so I'm looking at routes. How do we can? How else can we account for the uh, interesting links that are, are again are largely unstudied because of the way the 20th century has shaped uh, the kinds of questions we want to ask of, of our um, of our history? Uh, but I, sus I suspect there are some very interesting, deep uh, uh, insinuations of peoples from the Balkans and the Middle East often um, through the mechanisms of this Ottoman state. And one example is education. Uh, the investment by the Ottoman, the late Ottoman states to try to better integrate its populations and try to create this uh, larger sense of, 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 of solidarity that became uh, increasingly necessary as outside powers used difference, ethnic differences or sectarian differences as a wedge to um, undermine Ottoman sovereignty in many parts of the Balkan or the larger Middle East, led to these uh, programs of trying to teach common uh, history, try to teach it through a common language, uh, and allowed for students who were recruited from places like Yemen, from throughout uh, what today is Jordan or Syria and Iraq, as well as Albanians uh, from the Balkans to actually meet uh, in these schools, these specialized schools, in this case, uh, this imperial school for tribes, tribal peoples in Istanbul, which um, then would, uh, would be used, served as a conduit and then to send these same uh, students from supposedly backward parts of the Ottoman Empire, once they had been educated to a certain extent in that initial school, to be then sent off to these other feeder schools where they would learn to become civil administrators or uh, engineers where they then go back and serve the empire. Uh, other interesting points of uh, meeting points for peoples from all over the Ottoman territories, which means then the interaction between uh, uh, boys, young men from the Balkans and young men from the Arab, Arabic speaking world would be these schools in Istanbul, like Roberts College or AUB, which would recruit actively not only from the immediate area of Lebanon, Syria, but also from parts of the Balkans. Uh, so th this could be an interesting way for us to explore further um, how uh, uh, the Balkans in the Middle East have been uh, integrated and fused and where people who have seemingly different homelands or different home origins uh, can find common space. Uh, one of the other more important institutions uh, was established by uh, or developed by Hassan uh, Tass Tassim, uh, who is an Albanian, uh, Tassini, sorry, uh, Albanian alim, who was educated in Paris while he was out of an embassy there. And he, in his writings, uh, would prove to be one of the more important sources of inspiration for his contemporaries who would later uh, emerge out of uh, Cairo and Azhar, uh, 
And just again, to give you an idea that these kinds of institutions of social development state could actually be interesting points of interaction for uh, migrants from throughout the empire, uh, linking the Balkans intellectually, spiritually, as well as professionally uh, with uh, the, uh, the Middle East. Uh, also, interesting uh, spaces of interaction that I have been writing for are theater groups who would perform in using common languages. Uh, and uh, this part of the group uh, would be associated with a man who would eventually become a, a president of Albania. He would be the first bishop, archbishop of the Apostolic Ottoman, uh, sorry, uh, Albanian Orthodox Church in 1923. And before he migrated to Boston, he was actually spent time in, in Egypt where he became a prominent uh, member of a theater group. Uh, established and funded by other Albanian Orthodox Christians uh, who use the common languages of Greek, of Albanian, depending on the audience, and also Arabic. And these groups would travel throughout the Mediterranean um, in the 1890s, 1900s. And once again, complicate more how we uh, uh, talk to the peoples who live in these uh, regions, uh, how we unfortunately since insist on using ethno-national identities or language politics as somehow uh, a criteria of dividing uh, and understanding these communities as separate, where in fact the Italian workers, the Maltese workers, the Greeks, the Albanians, the Bosniaks, uh, the Montenegrins who would come to Egypt to help, for instance, uh, build roads, establish railroads, build the Suez Canal, which in the, throughout the 1860s would require hundreds of thousands of migrant workers to come, uh, would also require some kind of uh, relief, uh, some kind of entertainment. Uh, there would be newspapers that would emerge. There would be these theater groups that would entertain these migrant workers. And uh, this would be a space for common, uh, a common sharing, uh, a learning of each other's cultures, sometimes even using the crude stereotypes that circulate these communities. And studying theater groups, I think, is a wonderful way for us to getting into more what this whole workshop is about. Exploring the theater material, uh, sorry, the cultural material uh, uh, references that shape sometimes the architecture of uh, the Middle East and the Balkans of this period. Uh, to remind everyone the larger historical context of this period, the Ottoman Empire is a, um, uh, increasingly being torn at the seams by uh, outsiders who see windows of opportunity to exploit uh, so-called ethnic differences. Uh, meantime, the Ottoman Empire attempts to address this while also suffering from bankruptcy uh, due to borrowing heavily uh, from these same Western powers uh, led to uh, uh, ideological transformations of Ottoman society. The stress of uh, constitutionalism, embracing these ideas that um, had uh, secured uh, revolutionary uh, support in Russia, sorry, in, uh, in Italy, um, in uh, parts of Greece, in Spain, would also translate amongst those who would travel back from, um, the, from Europe, especially, or from America, come back to their Ottoman Balkan homelands, come back to the Middle East, and serve as revolutionaries to support the Committee of Union and Progress, constitution, demand for constitutionalism. And one of their famous units who actually initiated the revolt in 1908 that led to the reinstatement of the constitution that was promising to help uh, the larger Ottoman Empire uh, meet, meeting uh, um, in, uh, in sessions of parliament where Arabs, uh, Armenians, Circassians, Albanians, Jews, Christians, Muslims would meet and share a common uh, enterprise called the Ottoman Empire as a constitutional monarchy. Uh, and it was initiated by a military unit that was led by Major uh, Ahmed Niazi, an Albanian himself, but he actually had Arab soldiers in his units who fought and some of them died to push this idea, uh, Ottomanism, of a, a constitutional uh, regime moving forward. And so this idea that you know, we look at the rest of the world um, as the rest of the Muslim world as being colonized by European capitalist powers, but the Ottoman Empire, if they can somehow embrace this harmony, 
where somehow the Balkans and the Mashrik can cohabitate and stop pushing and pursuing this, uh, these, these agendas of ethno-nationalism, uh, this demand for separation from the larger empire that the Ottoman Empire can provide, can serve as a home for all of these disparate communities. And indeed, we're promos- promoting the idea of a unified society. And that could be reflected in a number of ways, obviously through, uh, with, through these schools, uh, an opportunity to actually teach a certain style that becomes a synonymous with late Ottoman architecture, for instance. Uh, another important dynamic that is reflective of how this Ottoman history of May, uh, there was a line of, of, of logic that Balkan peoples and peoples of the, of the Middle East were in fact part of the same society, the same project was in fact taking place uh, in the diasporas, which I would identify in this book, Ottoman refugees, as an Ottoman diaspora that was moving back and forth from breaking apart along ethno-national lines, as well as uh, along class lines, but all times regenerating to becoming a unified enterprise that brought Albanians, for instance, with uh, people from Syria, uh, people from uh, Palestine together for common cause. Uh, and uh, this is, this, it starts bringing into all kinds of questions that um, I, I, I don't necessarily I don't have time to cover here. But in the case of, for instance, in uh, newspapers you could find in Trieste, Albanian language newspapers, there were a call, open calls to stop the migration from Ottoman, Alba, uh, Ottoman Albania to the Americas. That in fact, uh, this uh, depletion of manpower, even though many of these men would come back quite wealthy, uh, uh, that they would often go for many, many years, sometimes never coming back. And this was considered by the begin, right, right before the Balkan Wars of 1912, a net loss for the Ottoman society. So there were actually attempts in the publication of uh, small ads in places like Trieste, where lots of people from the Ottoman Balkans would actually board ships to then go off to the Americas, uh, that they were um, encouraged um, to try to stay home and try to do something to help the Ottoman survive this transition, which included sending men to, to uh, fight the struggle in the case of uh, World War I. Um, here we have a very interesting moment of, of synergy in which the Ottoman esprit plays itself out all the way in Buenos Aires, where you have, this, as you can see from the picture on the right, um, Albanian um, um, society, even though Albania is now occupied by uh, European uh, Balkan powers, uh, uh, there is nevertheless a, uh, an Albanian diaspora group that has been teaching children uh, the Albanian language. They nevertheless have a strong association with the Ottoman Empire still, and they form an alliance with uh, Ottoman Jewish community in, in Buenos Aires, as well as Syrians, most of whom were Christian, but there were also some Syrian Muslims. I give brief mention uh, to, to this moment of solidarity in uh, the book that I just uh, mentioned. So you can have, um, even though, even in this moment of large uh, migration across the uh, seven seas, even to the Americas, where a whole new life um, shaping the life, the shaping the worlds of these people, making up a diaspora that could be a ethno-national one that promotes. Arab literature and Arab nationalism, uh, especially during and after World War One, the, uh, the competing ideas of what would be best for the homeland, whether it be occupation by the British or French or resistance to that effort. And it's sometimes conjoined with those from the Balkans who shared a common empire uh, until at least 1912. And some of the same, many of the architects of this process were this very famous uh, he's the founder of the uh, modern uh, Egyptian opera. He built the first opera house uh, in the suburbs of, of Cairo, um, Athanas uh, Tashko. Uh, he also was, uh, made a hell of a lot of money um, uh, with the field, the land that he owned in throughout the Delta. Uh, he built a series of hotels, and he would become a main patron of this interesting fusion that potentially could have maintained that link between the Balkans and especially Egypt, one that indeed does continue on until at least World War II, uh, 
why our large numbers of uh, people from the Balkans are migrating to Egypt and vice versa. That has somewhat changed since World War II. And lastly, this helps us understand and appreciate what happens as a consequence to the Balkans being largely uh, severed from the Ottoman Empire in 1912-1913 with hundreds of thousands of uh, now refugees making their way into what remained of the Ottoman Empire. And this continues on uh, this old tradition of identifying and then collectively resettling people known for certain skill sets. In this case, with this, uh, uh, this picture taken in Beshiva in 17, uh, this is a factory uh, producing leather products, uh, military equipment for the Ottoman military with um, uh, artisans from Albania, um, who uh, the recruitment process is completely unknown. I don't know how they ultimately end up making their way uh, to Beshiva, but um, it is nevertheless uh, clear from the photo and from the few letters that I found that they were all brought, brought together. There would be something that they all have in common, they can cohabitate with each other, and they would ultimately make a small neighborhood in the town itself and go to work every day during World War I. What happens to them afterwards is hard to tell, but many of them were obviously able to assimilate and stay behind for many uh, generations after. So this, the continuity of this um, it, um, itinerates, what I call the Balkan itinerates, who find themselves traversing the world and making the, uh, and establishing themselves in the mind, uh, continues on even after World War I, where a new wave of especially Albanian and uh, Greek Muslims find themselves once again being expelled by the states that acquire their homelands. And in the case of, uh, of Mashek, it becomes an interesting consequence that I shall get to in a second. So one of those men that I mentioned before, Fanoli, becomes the founder, first archbishop of the Albanian Orthodox Church, spent much of his early adult life in this uh, uh, process of uh, itineracy, of traveling back and forth between the East Mediterranean world and the Americas, spending a lot of time in Egypt, uh, and, uh, and becoming uh, someone who had, even in uh, post-Ottoman Balkans, a vision in which the Balkans and the East Mediterranean is indeed home, not just a small country that was carved out of the Ottoman Empire. This in, ties in interesting actors who will shape the dynamics of the Middle East for the next uh, 100 years, the industrialists of the North Atlantic world, especially those around oil. Uh, uh, it's interesting, the very creation of Albania, its preservation of what remains of Albanian lands, uh, in many ways is a reflection of what was deemed to be a poten potentially very lucrative source of oil by the Rockefeller family and EP. And, and as the British and the Americans basically uh, competed with each other over Persian Gulf or Arab Gulf oil, oil around uh, Mosul, um, and pipelines that would go through occupied Palestine in the mandate period, Similar, similar dynamics are at play in places like Albania, which uh, uh, brings me to this one, another interesting uh, point of intersection that will shape dramatically the 20th century Middle East and most likely shape forever um, the architecture, the design of cities, the function of cities, and, 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 and the investment in certain kinds of infrastructure and not others. Uh, that is the emergence of uh, these... Uh, leading royal families, so-called royal families that the British first would cultivate a relationship permits for their expansion, encourage their expansion at the expense of those who were uh, resisting British imperialism in the 1920s, whether it be Sharif Hussein of, of the Hijaz, who was, over, who was thrown out of Mecca Medina by the British supported uh, Ibn Saud in the 1920s, to other cases on the, uh, the Gulf of Hassa, and elsewhere. And uh, one of the in interesting players that has a big impact on the 1920s politics of Palestine, also in the politics of Albania, was this man named Charles Crane, who um, is, uh, makes his fortune actually um, uh, in family, in uh, plumbing fixtures, so piping, uh, bringing water and, uh, and waste in and out of buildings. 
And he would actually, as a, it was a gesture of trying to secure a political uh, alliance with uh, Sharif Hussein before he was expulsion from Mecca and Medina, actually offered uh, a, probably the first uh, uh, installment in the Arabian Peninsula of this uh, uh, plumbing fixtures. Uh, so running water and human waste would be then uh, circulating in and out of houses uh, here on out. And he spent a considerable amount of, of energy and money trying to influence the fate of Palestine. Uh, um, he indeed would um, be part of this famous King Crane um, advisory board in the early 20s and, and pursued a policy in which uh, early Zionist migration to Palestine was considered dangerous and um, disruptive. And uh, he, he did not, in his reports, uh, support the continued migration to the region by European Jews. Uh, and, and he also, in, in interesting ways, is all very much invested in Yemen. He, through his uh, chief engineer, um, who will be the founder, by the way, of Aramco later on, uh, was uh, using uh, these new technologies of piping, of valves, um, offering the imam of North Yemen um, his philanthropic works, his offer of trying to bring uh, new technologies to seemingly backward societies that have, are using antiquated farming techniques. Uh, and, and the idea that pipelines uh, would become a, a part of the, the future infrastructure certainly transforms how engineers approach the construction of roads, of uh, the questions of delivering water to new areas of population, of expansion, will transform, obviously, uh, uh, according to uh, the, the availability of this new kind of technology of, of pipes and pumps that uh, it, it is thanks to uh, this crane and his chief engineer, Twitchell, who, again, will be the founder of, uh, of Aramco, once he is thrown out of Yemen by the imam, who does not trust uh, this, the intentions of these people in the 1920s. Why are they running around drilling holes into the ground? Um, and it was clearly they were also looking for oil. So all these things play an important part in shaping uh, how our cities are built in the Middle East. And now one, one other group of itinerants from the Balkans who will have dramatic, trans dramatic impact on on not only uh, uh, Bilal al-Sham, but also the larger Islamic world, will be these Albanians who settled in Damascus after the crisis of uh, the 1920s, when so many of them were being expelled from their homelands due to sectarian politics in Yugoslavia and Greece. Um, the, the, his story, I uh, don't want to dwell on because we're running, we definitely have run out of time. He has nevertheless become now synonymous with this new era of Salafism, uh, of had, uh, uh, hadith scholarship, uh, he will um, at some point become associated with a whole generation of scholars who, um, until recently, were quite predominant throughout the larger Islamic world, and gives you a sense of how um, the Balkans and the Middle East, by way of the migration dynamic, can actually then lead to global um, uh, transition where uh, Albani and then uh, countrymen come a little later to Damascus, uh, or his family would at least, would become synonymous with, uh, uh, with certain uh, uh, formulas of, of training and studying Hadith and the dissemination of Islam in new ways throughout the 20th century. So uh, uh, there, there are many aspects that we can look at, look at um, the relationship between the Balkans and the Middle East uh, through this prism of cultural, intellectual, even and um, human resources moving back and forth. And I would suggest that uh, in, the, in the future, I'm hoping that some scholars maybe in this workshop or elsewhere can start pursuing and thinking again, uh, using some of these aspects perhaps that consider the very rich history that extends to the modern era, which becomes coterminous to the emergence of the modern era in the larger world as well. So thank you very much. I know end my uh, presentation with slides. You can see it spent maybe a little bit more time than I wanted, but inshallah there'll be um, 
some energy left for some questions. If not, I can also just so first be quiet. Of all, I'd like to thank thank you very very much for this uh, great presentation that is immensely rich. Um, I definitely enjoyed it so much. I'd like first to open the floor for uh, questions, uh, if we have some, perhaps, uh, or if uh, the audience is still trying to kind of collect their thoughts. But definitely, uh, I perhaps uh, will take uh, a, a second to just uh, like uh, reflect on the, on what you just uh, presented or at least part of it that indeed uh, one of the, I think perhaps the main aim for this workshop and series of lectures is to uh, open again a discussion uh, uh, about um, reorienting a little bit the, the perspective, the focus of history. So in so far, um, the main or the dominating perspective on history is uh, kind of uh, uh, focused on the West and, uh, and perhaps the way it influenced uh, other countries. But uh, uh, instead we are trying to uh, like uh, shift the focus on the relationships and the exchange, the mutual ex exchange that you have just shown from uh, different parts of the world. So it, it, that we're, we're not just provinces nor receivers, uh, but they were very much producers uh, and um, uh, produced uh, uh, thoughts and, uh, and definitely were uh, crucial for the world balance and you have just shown how certain dynamics or, or even just uh, uh, figures are still influencing uh, our contemporary world. So uh, definitely we hope that this workshop is just uh, a beginning of um, a longer exchange uh, that from our hand in, uh, in Palestine, especially we are starting by digging into archives that were not uh, open to the public and uh, most of them are uh, private. So privately owned by families trying to search for um, more of uh, these uh, figures and persons that actually built uh, the country and that studied abroad or came from abroad and uh, they are uh, out of uh, the historical records. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, to the floor if we have questions perhaps. So I think we have one. Okay, so... Um, would you please unmute? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Blomi. It was very inspiring, and I think you triggered many questions in my head, especially that recently I'm very interested in this period of uh, the last uh, maybe 70 years of uh, the Ottoman Empire. So starting from Tanzania until now, but you opened my eyes on the things that happened a bit before with the Muhammad Ali um, um, Republic. So um, my question is, in, in most of your um, um, input, we have seen examples of sharing in one direction. So it's from Balkan to the Middle East. Uh, what is What about the other way around? So from the Middle East to Balkan or to East Europe? Did, did you notice any kind of exchange in that way? Uh, yes, indeed, throughout the Ottoman period, but obviously even before the, the rise of the Ottoman Empire, during the periods of, uh, let's say, um, the rise of Islam, the interactions between uh, the arrival of uh, uh, Arab Muslims to Kibris, to Cyprus, to their engagements, and indeed their... Um, uh, proselytizing Islam. Uh, we know that there were Muslim communities already in the beginning of the 10th uh, century in uh, parts of the Balkans, uh, uh, largely due to trade routes that many had just simply repeated previous generations, patterns of commercial exchange. 
uh, the, the Balkans and the East Mediterranean have never been separated. Uh, uh, again, since the Roman times. Now, whether or not uh, we want to associate the Middle East today with a particular uh, linguistic group or people who have acquired a certain association with the world through the, through faith, through a message from God, is um, depends on the periodization. Uh, now, if you are focused and interested in the 19th and 20th century, uh, I did make mention that there were lots of soldiers who would move back and forth. So one of the sad ironies of the late Ottoman period in which it starts to lose wars, especially in the Balkan Wars, is that most of the troops who were defending Ottoman boundaries with Montenegro and Albania, for instance, were from Syria or Yemen. Uh, very cold conditions, uh, very difficult conditions. They were far from home and they were far from happy. Why would they want to defend this land? This is not their land. They've been there for in very difficult conditions for and vice versa, many people from this region were sent to Yemen as soldiers. So it was a strange calculation of, we don't want to have a concentration of indigenous peoples who could take up arms against the Ottoman Empire. So let's send them somewhere else to defend the empire. And that was a big mistake in retrospect, that uh, if you had people defending their own lands, there would be much less likely a military defeat uh, that was relatively easy on behalf of the Serbs or the, the Serbian state or uh, the Greek state in this interim period, because the soldiers were mostly not from the Balkans. And many of them, many uh, Arab men died in this part of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, did that have an impact as, as suggested with those who were recruited by Muhammad Ali, for instance, to go and help govern Sudan? Uh, at this stage of the Ottoman Empire, because of the way the military was so centralized, if you were a foot soldier uh, and you were forced to uh, join the Ottoman military as part of your requirement, civic re requirement, uh, unless you were uh, a general or a, a high officer, you would not have much decision, a much role to play in anything other than being a soldier, um, a consumer of products, of, of food, you may have some interaction with the immediate population around you. Um, we do have interesting pictures of occasionally uh, members of uh, the Ottoman army who are from Palestine or from Syria who are walking in, in these civilian spaces before the war. Um, some may have married, but it's, it's very hard to track. So in, in this era, modern era, it's, the Balkans is the net exporter of large numbers of people. Uh, the, those who are coming from the uh, Middle East, let's say, or the Arabic speaking world are gonna be coming as, as soldiers or as one or two uh, individual merchants or who may be on ships and then go back. Uh, it's, a, it's a very different migratory um, kind of system of exchange at this stage. Um, so again, you have this skilled set uh, groups who are being sent and recruited because already in Mashrik there are people from the Balkans by way of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire's uh, military elite, its elite in these universities, as I showed with the case of Takhir, is, is um, they're 